welcome to our channel where we talk all things true crime. This video is for educational purposes based on public knowledge. We do give our opinions at the end, but please do your own research. We mean no disrespect for any mispronunciation of names or places. Let's get started. As we begin today's story, there will probably be a lot of names and places mispronounced because this case took place in Germany, so please forgive us now. Karl Danka was born in February of 1860 in the Kingdom of Prussia, which is now part of Poland. He was born to a family of wealthy German farmers. Very little is known of Karl's childhood, but he was often described as a quiet and soft-spoken child who was difficult to raise. Karl could have had developmental delays, but wouldn't have been diagnosed. His lack of communication and rebellious behavior was hard to tame. It was said that he was one of the worst students at his elementary school. After graduating elementary school, Carl ran away at the age of 12. He had ran away before, but this time he didn't come back. At some point, he became an apprentice of a gardener and made a life for himself. When Carl was 25, his father died. His older brother would inherit their childhood home and farm, while Carl received money for his inheritance. Carl used his money to buy a piece of land and tried his hand at farming, but this would be a failure and he ended up selling the farm. Carl then used the money from the sale of the farm to purchase a house. Due to inflation, he would have to sell the property, but would be allowed to stay in a ground-level apartment. He acquired a vending license and ran a nearby shop, where he sold pickled pork and leather goods. Carl volunteered as a cross-bearer and an organist at the local Lutheran church, and was well-liked in his community, often affectionately referred to as Papa by the community for his generosity and willingness to help the homeless. He was seen as a pillar in his community. For unknown reasons, Carl Danka began murdering homeless vagrants and poor travelers that he didn't think would be missed. His first known victim was Ida Launer in 1903. Six years later, in 1909, he killed 25-year-old Emma Sanders. However, another slaughterhouse worker was found guilty of her murder and wouldn't be released until 1926 after the truth was discovered but his sentence was almost over at this point. It was thought that Carl probably picked up vagabonds from the train station as it was only a short walk from his home. He could easily gain the trust of these people and lead them to his home without anyone noticing as both the train station and his home were at the outskirts of town. Carl's last known victim was Roches Pollock. Carl also kept a ledger recording his murders in his butcherer book. It is also believed that he sold the flesh of his victims in nearby Breslau as pickled meat to unsuspecting customer, advertised as pork. On December 21st, 1924, Carl lured a homeless drifter named Vincennes Olivier into his home with the promise of paying him if he wrote a letter for him. Olivier had been directed to Carl by a townswoman woman, as Carl was known for his charitable nature. According to Olivier, he had sat down at the desk after being handed a pen and paper, but turned to his host after becoming perplexed when Carl dictated Adolf, you fat slob, in German. As Olivier looked to Carl, he saw Carl swinging a pickaxe at his head. Luckily, Olivier managed to duck, receiving a deep gash to the temple before he was able to wrestle the weapon away from Carl in an ensuing struggle. Olivier escaped through the front door, screaming that a madman was trying to kill him. This attracted the attention of neighbors, who then alerted the authority. Initially, Olivier's testimony was disregarded on account of Carl's reputation among townsfolk. Olivier was actually arrested for vagrancy and panhandling, which was absolutely terrible as as he had just escaped Carl's grasp with his life. However, in court, the judge insisted on an investigation of Olivier's claims, and Carl was taken in for questioning. Carl was placed in a holding cell, where he hung himself just hours later with an unspecified ligature before interrogation could begin. With this turn of events, Carl's home was searched, and the police found the gruesome truth of his murders and cannibalism. Discovering unidentified flesh that was being cured inside of two tubs filled with brine, a box with an assortment of human bones, in human fat stored inside pot. They also discovered several items, including shoes, belt, braces, and shoelaces that analysts determined were made with canned human skin. While the exact number 
of his victims is unknown. Pearl's butcher book had 31 names recorded with Olivier, the escaped victim, listed as number 31. He was almost definitely going to kill Olivier. This would confirm at least 30 victims at the hand of Pearl Danka. His butcher book contained 26 men and 4 women. Next to each name, he would list their date of death, date of birth, and information about their relationship status. His method of killing was beating his victims with the blunt end of his axe, and then he would process the bodies as if they were animals in a butchery. Absolutely disgusting and heartbreaking. But due to the large number of body parts found in his home, his body count was estimated to be as high as 42 or even higher. Carl had a collection of 351 human teeth that he organized and repaired. An investigation years later would report that four-fifths of his victims were seniors, the youngest victim being 16. Two victims were probably 20 to 30 years old, one victim 30 to 40 years old, and the majority of the victims significantly older than 40 years old. Carl would make several items from human remains, like shoelaces and suspenders. Carl was wearing a pair of these suspenders when he killed himself. This would lead to decades of speculation about motives, methods, and actual numbers of victims. No one can say for sure that he ate any of the victims or fed them to anyone. There is only speculation of what he was doing. Since he was selling pickled pork and didn't have a pig farm, it can be thought that the meat was indeed human and not pork. A detailed report was released of what was found in Carl's apartment. Some of those items included femurs, elbow bones, shin bones, collar bones, 120 toes, 65 feet, five first ribs, and 150 pieces of rib. All bones, with the exception of a few, were very light, porous, and fatless. Tools that were recovered included three axes, a large wood saw, a tree saw, a pickaxe, and three knives. Later, Carl's family stated that he had never shown signs of fear or disgust, but he did not have a violent temper. He only accepted an invitation once to have dinner with his brother's family, and Carl's brother recalled Carl had eaten two pounds of meat at dinner. The brother stated that Carl described himself as a glutton, but still Carl's good manners, humble behavior, and charity earned adoration in his community even though he was a bit of a recluse. Decades later, Carl's case remains mostly forgotten. Still much about Carl's life, motives, methods, and the exact number of victims remains unknown. Only two photographs of Denko were known to exist. The property where these heinous acts took place still stands today. So what do we think about Papa Denka? I don't know. It's odd. It's very odd, but it was definitely a different time too. You think he ate the people? I was about to say, there's no way he didn't. Why would he be pickling their meat? Yeah. And his brother said at that dinner, he ate two pounds of meat and called himself a glut. That's and, just odd. You know, he had to sell the property because of inflation and they let him live in a lower level apartment. Looking through old photos, it looked like a shed on the property. Yeah. So to me, it seemed like he was impoverished. Yeah. And he might have been doing it as a way of survival. Yeah, because he wasn't good at gardening either. No, he wasn't. And, you know, if he did have developmental delays, not making excuses for him, but it might have been hard for him to discern right from wrong. Yeah. I can see that. Still absolutely horrific and terrible for all of those that were involved. I mean, I can kind of understand he might be doing that out of, um, you know, a need to survive. Like but, necessity. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know if it would have so much to do with his, like... Cognitive ability? Yeah. He, like his delays. If he had delays. If just, he had them. Just, it was speculated, right? It was speculated. It shows some form of knowing that it was wrong. Obviously, he's hiding it. And then he would lure people back to his house to commit these crimes. They weren't impulse. You know, this is true. And he picked people that he didn't think were going to be missed. Yes. Like most modern day serial killers will pick prostitutes and transients because they're harder to keep track of, to find, because they move around so much. Yeah, and probably because they do, they are kind of like out on the lam. Their family's used to them not being around. Yeah. So if they do report them missing, it's going to be like a long time after. And in his butcherer book, it said that he wrote down their relationship status, which sounds like, okay, are they married? Do they have children? Is there somebody um, going to come looking for them? Yes. So I think he knew what he was doing was wrong. I definitely think he ate people. But given the time period and with inflation where he had to sell his farm and he wasn't good at farming or gardening, he saw that maybe as another way to survive and it was something he could perform. Maybe. Maybe he maybe in some sick, twisted way he saw it as the only way to survive. I don't know. He had that shop and he would sell meat. So where to get the meat? He had no pigs. Yeah, he didn't, like, he didn't have a farm anymore. And the fact that he also was generous, like, I think he liked that status, too. 
So he would pick people that people wouldn't miss to help him preserve his appearance. Like, you know, what people thought of him in his community. Because he wanted to be seen as somebody that could give and help. Yeah, and be well-liked. And well-liked. Plus, you have to think, the community would send people to him, too. Yeah, this is true. Like, oh, he can help you. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a good guy in town. He, he helps people all the time. And then they probably just thought, you know... He helped them, and then they went on their way to wherever they needed to go because yeah. they were travelers or just passing through. I mean, because he did at one point have an inheritance, so who's to say he didn't claim that's how he got the meat to sell or, you know, how he survived in general? Like, he still had the money? Yeah. yeah. And then he was giving because he had extra meat. Yeah, and you know, um, mentioning his inheritance, I kind of forgot about that for a second. Like, when he got the inheritance, like, what if he was used to living a certain way that he wanted to continue to maintain that? Yeah. But he didn't know how to do it. You well, know yeah. what I mean? And so... There's plenty of people like that. But again, all of this is alleged because as soon as they brought him in for questioning, he hung himself. And you know, and that shows guilt. signs of guilt as well. He didn't want to. I don't think he wanted to confess either. People yeah. that do that is because they don't want people to know what they've done. This is very true. They don't want people to like, it It still would um, Put a tarnish. Yep. I was going to say paint him in a bad light. He yeah. wanted to keep his reputation that he He had didn't want to face the music treated. basically. Yep. Pretty much. Because then everyone would be like, oh my God, he did what? And like, <laughs> did I eat a human? Like. I'd be oh my gosh, that's creeped so, out. I would be I would be very creeped out in that area thinking I bought pickled pork from Carl and it was not pork. I mean, somebody that was already like I needing know. help and And he took advantage of them. Those are the worst kind of people. I mean, anybody that harms other people, they're just terrible, but to take advantage of poor and weak people. Poor weak people that, you know, need help and they're already down on their luck. I feel like that's... And they're desperate. Absolutely terrible, yeah. And you have to think, some of them might have felt like something was off, but again, when you're at that level, you'll ignore the of red disparity. flags. Yeah, because they're trying to survive too. Yeah. And they're thinking, oh, here's this generous man, like... What Even a, if he's kind of odd or What a recluse. blessing. Oh my god. What do you guys think? Have you heard of this story? Let us know in the comments. If you like this video, please consider subscribing and turn on notifications for future videos. Until next time, stay safe.